Welcome at the course on thermodynamics. This is a first lecture. The course the, has the goal uh, to continue the line that, which was started by previous course, warmth layer, theory of heat. And in particular, my mission for this course is to show you that using language definitions and the laws that you have already learned in the theory of heat, you can uh, uh, explore physics on your own because all these laws definitions, they can be used to derive new laws practically in every area of physics. Here as a joke, uh, in the title I put that the mission of the course is to go from theory of heat to universal theory of almost everything. Well, there are many people who underestimate the importance of thermodynamics and there are many people who even do not like thermodynamics and there is a very good reason for that. The reason number one is that thermodynamics operates with temperature and temperature is a counterintuitive concept. It's not additive quantity. If you have two bodies with temperature T1 and T2, you bring these two bodies together and you cannot say what kind of, what the temperature of these two bodies will be afterwards. There is no standard of temperature like we in the National Institute of Standards in the United States, also here in the Netherlands, you can find standard of time, you can find standard of length, you can stand, find standard of mass, but not standard of temperature. There is no standard for one Kelvin or for one Celsius degree. Another thing, entropy, you learned in theory of heat that entropy is a very important quantity there, but there is no device to measure entropy. Why do we need a quantity which we cannot measure. But next to these disadvantages, we also have advantages that thermodynamics and the laws derived in theory of heat can be applied practically in every area of physics. Condensed metaphysics, including magnetism and superconductivity, physical chemistry, and even astronomy. In particular, since my background is magnetism in my course, I will show you many examples how thermodynamics can be used to explore magnetism. And this can be done by you already at the level of the second year, even if you haven't heard so much about magnetism yet. And I'm also proud to say that also another very important uh, physicist in 20th century, Albert Einstein, uh, thought that thermodynamics may be, may be the most universal, is the most important part of physics. He said that it's the only physical theory of universal content which uh, within the framework of applicability of its basic concepts will never be overthrown. So it's a quite a statement. So basically it puts thermodynamics, I would say, even in the center of all physics. And for today, we have two main things to treat. We have to talk about basic definitions and laws of thermodynamics, and it will be a lot of repetition of the course of uh, theory of heat. And I especially would like to emphasize among all these definitions and laws, the concept of reversibility and the concept of entropy. First of all, system. The system that we will use, we will study in thermodynamics, this would be macroscopic entity, so something large. It's something with which, which would consist of great number of atoms, molecules, electrons, or it can be even something that consists of fields, like electromagnetic field. It can also be taken as an object in thermodynamics, something that we can study and build uh, and derive laws of behavior based on the concepts of thermodynamics. We will talk about isolated system if the system has no interaction with surroundings. Very important postulate. If you take post thermodynamic system and leave it alone, sooner or later this thermodynamic system will achieve thermodynamic equilibrium. It is a state in which the quantities that describe the system do not change anymore. So it is a stable state. We will call it thermodynamic equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium is a particular example of thermodynamic equilibrium and it is applicable to the case when you're talking about heat transfer. If you have two bodies, hot body and cold body, you bring them together, there will be heat flow between them and it will stop at a certain moment. When it stops, we call the situation thermal equilibrium. We say that these two bodies are in thermal equilibrium. Temperature, the most uh, 
counterintuitive concept in thermodynamics. Despite your feeling that temperature can be measured by thermometer, temperature is something very abstract in thermodynamics. It is the quantity that equilibrates when thermal equilibrium is achieved. You have hot body, cold body, you bring them together, something happens in the system, and when, uh, in, in, in these two bodies, and when these two bodies achieve thermal equilibrium, we say that they reach the situation of equal temperatures. Another very important postulate is that if you have the situation of thermal, uh, thermodynamic equilibrium, you can express any internal uh, property, like if you talk about ideal gas, for instance, you can express volume in terms of external properties, like pressure in, terms of, in, in the case of ideal gas, and it's always temperature with it. In the thermodynamic equilibrium, internal parameters of a system are functions of external parameters and temperature. And if you talk about thermodynamic equilibrium, it means that parameters that characterize the system do not change. In thermodynamic, equi thermodynamic equilibrium, the very same statement can be made for external parameters, like in the case of ideal gas or just gas, we can, we can write expression for pressure, which would be a function of volume and always temperature. These equations will be called equations of state. Then basic laws. You've had already in the course of Arntelier about basic laws of thermodynamics, basic laws of heat uh, theory, and this is zero's law of thermodynamics and the first law of thermodynamics. I explicitly want to, stay, uh, to, to, to pay attention to the first law of thermodynamics, which is just conservation of energy. You can perform work on this system, you can transfer heat to the thermodynamic system, and both work and the heat are forms of energy. These forms of energy will be used to change internal energy of the system. So as I said, this is so-called first law of thermodynamics, exactly in the form you had it in the previous course. In this course, I would like to pay special attention to the fact that these quantities are rather different. They have different properties in thermodynamics. And difference can be better seen if you write the very same law in differential form, where next to differential for heat and work, I put additional stripe that emphasizes that work and heat are not exact differentials. It means that if for internal energy, which, well, assume that internal energy is a function of two parameters, A and B, if for internal energy you can write an expression like this, it cannot be done for the case of work and it cannot be done for the case of heat, because if you think that you assume that work, for instance, is a function of A and B, two parameters, then you want to find a total work performed by the system, for instance, and it's a function of A and B. As a physicist, you know that in order to calculate this integral, you have to know the path the work performed by the system and the path uh, and the heat transferred to the system, they both depend on the path. So basically, it's a, the very same thing that I put here. If you calculate an integral like this for internal energy, it is path independent. If you cal calculate this integral for work or heat, it is path dependent. If you talk about internal energy, you can write expression like this. If you talk about work or heat, you cannot write expression like this because as physicists we know that heat uh, and work depends on the way the total amount of heat we transfer to the system to come from state 1 to state 2 depends on the way we came to state 1 to state 2. So, and with this cartoon on the slide I emphasize that if you want to calculate work performed by the system, you have to know the path. 
But in the very same slide, you can easily calculate the change of external, uh, internal energy uh, upon transfer of this uh, uh, person from point one to point two. So once again, since work and heat are not exact differentials, we will write these dif signs slightly different. Another very important definition of thermodynamics function of state, it is any property whose value doesn't depend on the path taken to reach that specific value. Internal energy is a function of state. Work and heat are not functions of state, as we just discussed. But pressure, for instance, if you talk about gas. Volume, again, if you talk about gas. These can also be treated as functions of states. These quantities do not depend on history. And functions of states are exact differentials. Important definition to uh, emphasize the difference between this course and the course of, uh, on theory of heat is heat capacity. Heat capacity in our case is defined in very general form. I will write it first. This is heat capacity measured when quantity alpha was changed and quantity beta and gamma were fixed. And next to this heat capacity, we can also define specific heat capacity which is this heat capacity, which we notate as C large, divided by mass. And then we get heat capacity, which we called specific heat capacity, and we use C uh, small letter C for that. Typical well, uh, examples of heat capacity, these are example, this, uh, in, in the case when we have volume and temperature as uh, variables, it could be heat capacity measured when uh, temperature was changed and volume was uh, kept uh, fixed or temperature was changed uh, or uh, pressure was or temperature uh, or volume was changed and temperature was kept fi fixed uh, temperature was changed volume was kept fixed the same you can define if you use pressure the same you can define using whatever quantity in physics for every particular case we will use a uh, particular uh, definition of heat capacity and now reversibility and entropy. These are very important uh, concepts in thermodynamics. And before I start talking about those, let me uh, emphasize that also entropy seems to be a very complex uh, uh, abstract uh, concept. And it's not very clear why do we need entropy at all, because we cannot measure this. Entropy is very important quantity, and it's a very important in the sense that without this, we cannot understand why uh, heat agents, for instance, cannot be made uh, uh, more efficient than a particular limit. In my course, I would like to, uh, in order to give, uh, to give you a feeling why, uh, why people came with a, such a weird concept of entropy, I would like to uh, give you, uh, I, will, I would like to tell you a little bit about history of an introduction of this concept, so that you can see how scientists came to this idea in the first place. And in order to understand the breakthrough in physics associated with introduction of, of this concept, I would like to uh, pay attention to a situation, for instance, 200 years ago when people were, uh, had already good un understanding of the fact that hot gas can perform work, and then they built weapon with the help of this. But thinking about something like, uh, and train was in science fiction, was, it was fantastic. So building something like a mechanical force, horse, sorry, was not really possible. So then they started to think how to build an efficient steam machine, because how to build an efficient heat agent that would transfer heat into work, and in this case, uh, do something useful with this energy. And first, first attempts to do build this heat uh, agent were unsuccessful. That's why people started to think about model of heat agent. And thinking about model of heat agent, they thought, well, it would be something as a working substance which will produce work. The work will be produced as a result of transfer of heat to this substance. Heat would be transferred from hot object. Well, for the, uh, to keep the picture complete, part of the heat will be rejected to cold object. 
And if you think about efficiency that heat uh, agent can achieve, it would be defined as a ratio absolute value of work divided by absolute value of heat transferred to the working body. Great. One important thing here, I put absolute value, is not to confuse you any longer uh, with the sign and then to make clear from the very beginning that we agree that if heat is transferred to the system, we will call it positive, and if heat rejected by the system, we will assume it is negative. If work is performed by the system, we will assume it is negative, and if we have situation when the work is performed uh, on the system, we will assume it is positive. So in each case, when we have arrow towards the working body, it is, we are talking about positive quantity. In each case, we have arrow outside working body, we are talking about negative quantity. Well, now, if you want to build working, uh, if you want to build an engine, we have working body, we will transfer energy, and of course, after uh, uh, a part of this heat would be transferred to work, and this should be repeated in cycles, so many cycles. After each cycle, we can write conservation of energy. If you take into account signs here, it would be minus V plus Q1 minus Q2. Very important thing that after each cycle, internal energy of working body shouldn't change. Otherwise, the working body will either, will either explode or will get exhausted and the engine will stop. And it will eventually arrive to this expression for the work. And this eventually gives me this very known expression for the efficiency. Then the next question, how large is Q2? Can it be ever be zero? So can we achieve efficiency of heat agent equal to one? And this question, which was, uh, this is exactly the question which was studied by Sadi Carnot at the beginning of 19th century, and he made very important discoveries in this study, although his understanding of heat was totally wrong. So he thought that heat is not energy, it's a special type of matter, which is called caloric, and the agent works not because we have uh, energy transfer from hot body to working body, but because we have flow of caloric, exactly as it happens in the case of a uh, windmill, flow of caloric that drives the wheel and produces some work. If you look at the, uh, at the original paper of uh, of Carnot, then it hardly contains any mathematics, it's mainly philosophy. And nevertheless, even with this uh, wrong understanding of physics, he was able to arrive to correct answers. And one of the observations that he uh, put as a central uh, in his work, as a cent central statement in his work, is the observation that heat never get never transferred spontaneously from uh, cold body to hot body. If the transfer of heat occurs, it always goes from hot body to cold body. It always goes such that temperatures of two bodies equilibrate. So hotness equilibrates. So and then it means that we can postulate that no process is possible whose sole result is a transfer of heat from colder body to hotter body. So if the heat goes spontaneously, it's always from hot to cold. This is something we can state. This is something which we see every day in nature. But it also means that no process is possible. The sole result of, uh, of each uh, is a complete conversion of heat to work. Well, how can this be proven? In order to prove this, it's uh, more convenient to draw a uh, hot body, cold body, cold re hot reservoir, cold reservoir, uh, and some hypothetical agent, which imagine that, it's a, uh, uh, imagine that this agent produces some work, and the only result of this is a complete con of, the, of the work of this agent is a complete conversion of heat to work. So no heat is rejected. 
So if this is possible, so what I will do, I will use this work to drive my agent, and if I supply work to agent, it will work in the opposite direction, so the same as a water mill, instead of producing energy, it will help me to pool water to a higher level and to dry out certain areas. Situation like this would be realized. Then I put this to uh, these two agents in the black box and know what I will get. I will get the situation that the water or caloric in this in case of Carnot spontaneously flows from low level to higher level. So the heat spontaneously goes from cold body to hot body, which is not possible. And it means that this process is not possible. And it means that whatever agent you build, a part of energy should be rejected in the form of heat to the cold reservoir. And Q2 is never zero. Next, Carnot realized another important thing and this is importance of reversibility. He found, he formulated, that if you want to build the most efficient agent ever, you have to build a reversible agent, something that can be reversed. So he showed, basically, that no agent operating between two reservoirs can be more efficient than a reversible agent operating between the same two reservoirs. If you want to prove this, you again use the same diagram with two agents, one reversible, like this one, and one hypothetical. We first build reversible agent that gets some heat Q1, produce some work, omega, uh, sorry, uh, delta, uh, uh, delta V, sorry, double V. Uh, reject some heat Q2. And next to this, we have hypothetical agent that gets some heat, reject some heat, and produces some work as well, W prime. And what we assume, assume that we succeeded to build hypothetical agent with efficiency better than reversible agent, and it means that if you draw uh, uh, right now expressions for the efficiencies, they will look like this, where we have to put prime here as well. Uh, so where we're talking about heat accepted by the working bodies, and work produced by the working bodies in two cases. Just assume that we uh, tune our agents such that works produced by the agents are equal. And the next thing, what I do now again, I take this hypothetical agent, I use this work produced by the agent to drive my reversible agent. So I use the fact that it's reversible. So it means I will, I will reverse the direction of arrows here And looking at this and at this expression, you can see that Q prime, Q1 prime, is less than Q1. And if you now put this into a black box again, we again succeeded to realize this situation when flow continuous, uh, spontaneously flows from cold body to hot body, which is not possible. And it means that this situation is not possible. It means that whatever agent you build, its efficiency would be less or equal to the efficiency of reversible agent. And if this equal, it means we build a reversible agent. From here, we conclude that all reversible agents are equally efficient. The questions that we can raise now. I mean, first of all, the statement. 
the state that we can conclude that reversibility is very important. It's very important to, to know if the agent we build reversible or not. Second, it is a question. Can we transfer heat a transfer and, uh, uh, and uh, transform heat into work in a reversible way? And how to design a reversible agent? These questions were treated in the previous course on warranty layer and the theory of heat. And I would like to repeat uh, the main concepts of these derivations once again in my course that to make sure that we understand these things in the very same way. First of all, I would like to make a statement about reversibility. So what is a reversible process? A reversible process is a process whose direction can be reversed by means of infinitely small changes of some property of the surroundings. During the reversible process, the system is in thermal equilibrium with its surroundings throughout the entire process. This is idealized process, similarly to frictionless motion. It's something which is difficult to imagine, but it's a very good approximation, very useful approximation in thermodynamics. This process, in, in, in this process, it is possible to return both the system and surroundings to the original state. As a, the best example of reversible process, you can think about circulation of water, compression uh, upon heating, and uh, cooling upon expansion. So if you slightly change parameters, the process goes in the opposite direction. And it's always, we're always talking about thermodynamic equilibrium. There is no heat flow. Uh, if, you, if you define a system uh, in, a, uh, in a proper way, <laughs> then uh, we will talk about reversibility also during question hour. So if you don't understand exactly what it means, please ask. We can discuss it and can we come with more examples. I would like uh, now to proceed to the next question, if it is possible to build reversible agent. Of course, you know it is possible already from the course of uh, warranty layer, theory of heat. I just uh, want to remind you the main steps which have to be done to achieve this. First of all, you have to calculate work performed by a gas. If you have gas on the piston and some volume and the gas expands performing work, you can calculate this work using the uh, known uh, impression expression like work is, a, uh, is given by the uh, product of pressure and the change of, uh, in the volume. Please make sure about the right sign here. If work performed by the gas, it should be negative and then we use the, the case that uh, you use the fact that for the ideal gas, product of uh, pressure and volume divided by temperature is constant. So a benefit from this case and uh, find expression for the work performed by the gas upon expansion. So here, please pay attention to the fact that work performed by the gas is proportional to temperature some constant temperature and logarithm. And this is work performed by gas upon exp uh, expansion from volume one to volume two. And looking at this, you can uh, think about an possible agent we can build and every agent, as I said, uh, will uh, run in the cycles. And at every cycle, there would be, of course, the most important part is performing work. It means that during this stage, a part of internal energy will be transferred to work. Another very important cycle, uh, step in this cycle is a transfer of heat to the body. So we increase internal energy, it's a heating. After gas performed work and pushed piston, of course, piston was brought somewhere, but then before we uh, repeat this cycle, we have to make sure that piston brought into the initial state. They always, it means that always we can uh, expect that there is a, sorry, there is a stage of restoring. So here, if gas expanded from T, uh, V1 to V2, here, the gas should be brought to the initial state. And looking at this expression, you see that if you want that work that you spent to restore piston into the initial state still less than the work performed by the gas, we have to have an additional step here in between, which is called cooling. 
we have to decrease temperature, otherwise work which we gain here will be lost here. So we have three, uh, four main steps, heating, working, cooling, restoring. And here cooling is a part, uh, it corresponds to the part when a, an, uh, a part of internal energy is rejected to the, uh, in form of heat to the cold reservoir. And these four steps can be seen as four important steps in operation of uh, heat agent. Then discovery of Carnot was based on the fact that he analyzed the work of heat agent in the case of ideal gas as working body. So he said that if we build an agent that consists of four steps, isothermal expansion, adiabatic expansion, isothermal uh, compression and adiabatic compression, we will in principle uh, satisfy the requirements of this cycle and produce and transfer heat Q1 into work W in a reversible way. But in the previous course, you treated Carnot cycle. You showed that Carnot cycle consists of four stages, as I said. So if you plot the operation of Carnot cycle in, in, the, in, in, the, in the coordinate system with pressure and volume, as I said, it's going to be four steps. Either thermal expansion, adiabatic expansion, as a thermal compression, adiabatic compression. For the case when working substance is ideal gas and if working substance is ideal gas, then we know physical meaning of temperature in this case. We can find that oh, Q1 divided by T2 plus Q1 divided by T1 is equal to zero, where T1 is a temperature of hot reservoir and T2 is a hot temperature of cold reservoir. From where it follows that this expression for the efficiency of heat agent for the case of reversible heat agent uh, with ideal gas as a working substance can be written in this way. And since all reversible agents are equally efficient, so the same is applicable for all reversible agents as well, not necessarily for those that use ideal gas as a working substance. Well, and here we arrive actually to a conclusion that we can define temperatures in thermodynamics. In thermodynamics, the ratio of thermodynamic temperatures of two reservoirs is equal to ratio of heat exchange at those reservoirs by a reversible agent operating between them. And now let me come with a puzzle. This is expression for efficiency of reversible agent. Now I consider two cases. In one case, Heat Q1 is transferred to working substance directly. In another case, the very same heat Q Q1 is transferred to working substance, uh, but via intermediate reservoir at slightly lower temperature. The question is, are the efficiencies of these two agents equal or not? Intuitively, if you think about heat in terms of caloric, in terms of liquid that flows from upper level to lower level, then you would expect that it will, you will get the very same efficiency here because, well, at the end, two working substances get the very same amount of heat in both cases. But if you use this expression, you see that in this case, the efficiency is like this. And in this case, the efficiency is different. 
And it means that in this case, when heat, the very same heat Q1 is transferred via intermediate reservoir, the efficiency is lower because the temperature of this reservoir is lower. So somehow, in this case, more heat will be rejected to the cold reservoir than in this case. Why? How does heat engine, this working substance, know that in this case more heat should be rejected than in this case? And this is an interesting question, and this is exactly the point when people started to, uh, where, where people started to struggle with, and they realized that heat, well, is not only caloric, heat should be, and energy should be treated differently, slightly differently, and in particular we need additional quantity that has to be introduced to understand what's going on, what is the difference in these two cases. And in order to understand the difference, let me write the expression for the difference in energy and difference in work produced here and here. Work is efficiency times Q1. Q1 in both cases is the same. So then we have Q1 times difference in efficiencies, which would be Q1, 1, T2, T1, minus 1, T2, T1 prime, which is equal Q1, T prime, minus Q1, T1, T2. And if you now define a new quantity, which is the heat divided by temperature, we arrive to a very interesting expression. The difference in work performed in this case and in this case is given by the difference in this quantity, delta S. That's how people realize that something missing in heat theory, and that's why at this stage there are, they introduced new quantity and they started to call it entropy. This quantity shows degree of degradation of, degradation of energy due to, due to something very important which happens here. If you look at this process, everything is reversible here because we have reversible heat agent operating between these two reservoirs. If you look at this case, this part is reversible, but this part is not reversible. Here we have heat transfer from hot body to colder body. It is a reversible process by definition, because we never can expect heat flow in the opposite direction. And then as a matter of fact, as a result of this irreversible process, part of energy degraded and it is present in the system, but is not able to perform work anymore. That's why we introduce this quantity, S. We call this quantity entropy. It originates from Greek word entropia, which means turning toward a transformation. And this is measurement of energy, which is present in the system, but is not able to perform work. So that's take home message of today, then temperature. Temperature is not something that you measure with thermometer, it's something that prescribes thermal equilibrium between two bodies and thermal contact. Ideal agent, heat agent, it's always reversible agent. And in order to understand the, uh, how the agents work, we have to distinguish reversible and irreversible processes. And entropy is introduced to measure the amount of energy which is present in the system, but unable to perform work. In this particular case, it is unable to perform work because there was a reversible process in between. Thank you for your attention.